Um, so yeah, thank you for having me today and uh, it's great to be with everyone. Just a little bit of background about me so you know uh, who you'll be listening to for the next little while. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of, of two companies. One is called Engages, and it's a research uh, and messaging company that helps organizations craft, test, and refine uh, messages, stories, and narratives. And then we have our technology business called Dialsmith, which develops those dials that you may have seen on CNN or Fox News during presidential debates. Uh, when uh, focus group respondents would watch the debate and dial up for what they like and down for what they don't like. Um, we actually make those dials. So um, you, you may see that or some version of that, of course, coming up in the current presidential debate cycle, but this is gonna be a very unique time with much less in-person research happening. So uh, we're not quite sure uh, how things are gonna play out this time around, but that's what our two, the two sides of our business um, do. My background is in, uh, I'm not a traditional researcher. My background is in sales, marketing, and communications, largely in the technology space. Uh, but I've been working in research now for quite some time, starting in research technology and then moving into more of the behavioral side of it. Um, I'm coming to you today from uh, Portland, Oregon, where I live. I grew up outside of Philly, so um, I, I'm, I'm right there with my East Coast and West Coast friends. Uh, experienced both sides of the country for, for a lot of my life. And um, outside of work, which takes up most of my time, uh, I spend time with my family and photography is a passion. And as far as how I'm feeling today, I'm feeling happy to be with everybody. So thanks so much uh, for having me. On the message testing side of things, the, the primary experience that I can bring to the table for this presentation are in these main areas. We do a lot of work in, in public policy messaging as well as uh, political messaging. We'll work sometimes with, with candidates or PACs, but most of the time it's more on the public policy side. And then on the consumer side of things, we do a lot of work in advertising and branding. And there's also a segment of research that some of you may be familiar with It's called litigation research where mock trials are run to test attorney presentations and witness testimony. And we test those in the same way that we test political messaging and consumer messaging. So anytime we start an engagement, we generally start with these three questions. And that is, what is it that our client uh, and their stakeholders want people to do? What do you need to know in order to have them do that? And then what's at stake for you and what's at stake for them if they don't do that? And when we can answer those three questions really well up front, we're able to design a study that will usually hit the mark. And the methodology that we follow is what I'm gonna show you with the case study today with uh, mask wearing, where we start by crafting the messages that we think will resonate with an audience. And then we design a research instrument to actually test that. And that's often a blend of quantitative research in a study to get a larger sample size. And then we'll often do qualitative research. When we're able to do in-person, we do focus groups or in-person one-on-one -on -one interviews. And right now, of course, we're doing it all online and through Zoom. So we're doing online focus groups, online, uh, interviews, things like that. And then we analyze what we find, we refine those messages based on that analysis. And then very often, uh, usually if budget allows, is when we'll go out and we'll retest um, what it is that we were able to refine from what we learned in the research study. And we have a lot of cooks in the kitchen on our side. So of course we have a team of researchers. We also have a team of technologists. One of those are actually on the line here with me today, his name is Eric, and he's gonna help play a couple of video clips for me. So if you hear me reference Eric, um, he's, he's my colleague on the technology side of our business. We have copywriters, we have those with more of a psychology, a psychology and behavioral science background. So we really bring all these different disciplines together in order to, uh, in order to execute these studies. So the segment of our work that I'll talk with you about today, that I'm hoping I can uh, add some value to what you do and leave you with some, some real tactics, 
is on the self-funded side of our work. Of course, most of what we do is, is for a fee and for clients, but we're always running one or more self-funded studies as well for things that we feel need to be uncovered, often for the public good, um, but that is we're not able to either do for a client or we're not able to talk about. And we actually have three of them going on right now. So we have something called the Swing Voter Project where every month, for a year and a half running up to the election. So we've been doing it for over a year now. We go into different swing voter counties around the country, swing voters being defined as those who voted for Romney and then Hillary Clinton, or those who had voted for Obama and then Donald Trump. And it's a very small segment of the electorate, but it's a very influential one because many think that it was the swing voter segment that actually uh, had a heavy influence on the outcome of the last election. So uh, we travel to different swing voter counties every single month and uh, swingvoterproject.com is the, is the website for that if you're interested in, in keeping up with, with what we're hearing from swing voters every month. We're also doing what's called the back to normal barometer, which we're now running every two weeks and we started uh, as soon as the COVID pandemic really took root and we realized that it was gonna be an indeterminate amount of time before things would get quote back to normal. And we needed to understand from the public how they were feeling about when and how things would start to get back to normal so that we could influence and help our clients and really help the public at large. So um, we're, we're doing that project where every two weeks we're fielding this tracking study called the Back to Normal Barometer. And that's also the website if you're interested in checking that out, backtonormalbarometer.com. And um, that will touch each and every one of you because it really shows you how the public is feeling about how and when things might start to get back to normal. And then thirdly was a much more narrow study that we decided to undertake. And that was to figure out uh, what it is about a certain segment of our population that are very resistant to the idea of wearing face masks and face coverings uh, as a means of slowing the spread of COVID-19. Um, and we've heard from the Surgeon General and we've heard from all kinds of other scientific researchers that if we could just get everyone to wear a mask and everyone to wear a face covering for a certain period of time, uh, we would have much better control over this uh, pandemic than we do in the United States today. And there is a definite segment of the population that are very resistant to that. And we wanted to understand what is it about that segment that's unique. And for policymakers and uh, business people who wanted to have a chance to influence that particular audience, what could we arm them with um, language wise in order to possibly be able to influence that group and that population. So that's what the mask study was about. And that's what I'm going to talk with you about today as an example of this kind of work of crafting, testing, and refining messaging, language, and stories in order to influence behavior. So we started the mask messaging study asking ourselves the three what questions that I mentioned earlier. What do we want people to do? This is often a very obvious answer, but it's important to define it crystal clear. We want people to wear masks and face coverings to slow the spread of COVID-19. Um, what do we need to know? We need to know what segment of people are resistant and what will change their minds. And then we need to know what's at stake. And what's at stake is getting the U.S. back to a normal way of life. And in this case, life and death is also um, at stake. So uh, th that's why we decided this was a really important study for us, for us to undertake. The methodology that we put together for this study was much like what I talked about earlier. Um, we designed a study up front, a survey where um, we surveyed those who are less likely to wear a face covering. And we crafted two different messages designed to persuade them. And one of those messages was much more gentle in tone, and one of them was much more assertive in tone. And I'll tell you in a moment how we went about kind of deciding on those two. And then I'm gonna play you some very short clips of each of those. They're each about two and a half, three minutes long and we won't play the whole thing, but I'll give you a couple of clips that are indicative of that. So the more assertive message really takes the very blunt approach of we're in the midst of a pandemic, tens of thousands of Americans are dead. Um, you need to do the right thing, you need to wear a mask. Um, much more assertive, much more in your face, much more dire. The more gentle approach is acknowledging that masks and face coverings are uncomfortable, 
there's still a lot we don't know about COVID-19. First, we were told not to wear masks. Then we were told we should wear masks. How do we know what's right? So it's a much more empathetic uh, approach to see if that would help influence people more than being very blunt and, and alarmist about things. So we don't come at those two ideas um, just by chance. Uh, there are quite a number of principles that we work on here uh, on the Engage Us and Dial Smith teams, and they're all rooted in social science, behavioral science, behavioral psychology, and it all kind of bubbles up into what we have created as a framework that we call behavioral storytelling, which is our method of crafting messages and stories based on the irrational or seemingly irrational ways people process information and make decisions. So if you're at all familiar with the, um, the discipline of behavioral economics, which uh, was coined by uh, Daniel Kahneman, who is a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist, and he wrote the book that you may have heard of, Thinking Fast and Slow. He really was one of the pioneers that created this discipline known as behavioral economics. And that is how people make financial um, and economic decisions based on how they're thinking and feeling. And one of the principles that he talks about that we used in this particular study, he calls it what you see is all there is. And in this case, talking about uh, a virus is very challenging because you can't see a virus. And therefore it's much harder for our brains to perceive that it's an actual threat unless we ourselves are sick or we see people or know people who are sick. So for the vast majority of us who are not sick and who don't have direct people in our lives who are sick, it's harder for us to perceive the fact that this is actually a very real threat because we can't see it. So on the flip side, you can see a mask and you can feel it and you know what it's like to wear it and you know that you don't like it and you don't want to wear it. So for a certain segment of the population, it's how do we reconcile that challenge of there's this virus that I can't see, and yet I'm being asked to do this thing that I don't want to do. And there are many people in the population who will simply do that because they believe it's the right thing to do. And there are others who will resist it because it just doesn't compute for them. It doesn't make sense for them. Um, so you might think that to some degree that's irrational, and it absolutely is, I believe, um, but it's also very human and it's something that we all deal with and we all encounter. Even if you're someone who, who willingly wears a mask in this environment, I guarantee you there are other aspects of your lives where you make incredibly irrational decisions that you're able to justify easily. I know uh, I'm saying that definitively because I know I do it, uh, I'm sure all the time, probably even more than I'm aware of. So behavioral storytelling really rolls up these two main principles, behavioral economics, which I talked about, which is rooted in these cognitive biases, which are really non-conscious brain shortcuts that we're all hardwired to use when we make decisions. And if you're curious to learn about those, I'm not going to take you through a laundry list of them now. Um, but if you just Google cognitive biases, you'll find articles, you'll find lists. I have a couple of videos where I talk about them in more detail, and I'll be happy to share those um, with uh, the AAF Lubbock team, and they, they can push that out if they'd like. Um, but there are more than 100 of these biases that have been defined as how our brains process information and make decisions. About 10 of them are the most common that we really all wrestle with every day, often not consciously. And then there's narrative economics, which is a newer discipline that really focuses on the stories and narratives that we tell ourselves that help inform the decisions that we make. And a lot of that has to do with self-worth and how we perceive ourselves and perceive ourselves relative to others. So when we take what we know about behavioral economics and what we know about narrative economics, we then bubble it up into this framework of behavioral storytelling where we can craft narratives and stories that will persuade and influence. Now, often it's tricky business though, because in this case, um, mask wearing or not mask wearing can often lead to things like shaming. Do I think I'm superior to you because I'm wearing one and there's something wrong with you if you're not? Or do you think less of me or more of me because I'm wearing one and you're not? 
um, personal freedom, self-reflection, things like that. All of that has to be taken into account when we try to figure out what's that messaging that we can use that will get what we're calling non-wearers to become wearers. So we crafted those messages, two versions of them, assertive and gentle, and then we send them off to our actors. And we have a small team of actors that we use anytime we do a messaging study, where they will then record those messages in front of a neutral background. We use actors because they know how to do it without emotion or with the particular emotion and inflection that we are looking for. Um, and so, Eric, if you would, we're gonna go ahead and play for you a, a short snippet of the gentle and assertive versions, just so you can get a feel for the difference. And then I'll start to take you through some of the things that we learned from this. We are in the midst of a global pandemic. Tens of thousands of Americans are dead from a disease spread by tiny droplets from people breathing, talking, sneezing, and coughing. The CDC strongly recommends that everyone wear a cloth face covering in public to protect themselves and others. Some Americans are refusing to do this. They resist being told what to do. But this rule is necessary to protect people and to prevent suffering in the community. Wearing a mask is a sacrifice we all should make for the public good. Mask when I go out. They're uncomfortable. They make conversation almost impossible and they hide smiles. What a mask seems to do is help protect the people around me. If I'm jogging around my neighborhood or walking my dog or sitting on the driveway with friends and neighbors, no mask. But in a store, I think a mask is reasonable. You don't know what I might be carrying, and I don't know what you might be carrying. We don't know the vulnerable people in each other's orbit. A mask limits the sharing. There's a lot we still need to learn about COVID-19. Right now, it looks like masks can reduce disease transmission. Maybe that will change as we learn more. Until it does, I'm going to play it safe for other shoppers and hope they'll do the same for me. So those, uh, those two versions, I'm sure you could tell, were quite distinct. The more assertive version uh, at the beginning and the more gentle version afterwards took very, very different tones. And that was quite deliberate to figure out not necessarily which one of those two will be the winning message, but what can we take from each of those to then craft the ultimate most perfect message once the study is complete. So we went into the field with this study and we fielded it with 142 US adults. And we asked some initial questions in the survey in order to focus on two particular groups, what we call sometimes wearers, those who will wear a mask or face covering out in public when they can't social distance from other people. And those we call never wearers who rarely or most likely would never wear a mask or face covering out in public. Uh, unless, of course, absolutely forced to and they had no choice. Uh, so each respondent answered some basic questions, including demographics and attitudes regarding COVID-19 and their own habits related to wearing masks. That's how we then segmented them into one of those two groups. We also segmented out the always wearers because they weren't relative to this study, uh, relevant to the study. Um, then we used our online dial testing tool. I mentioned the in-person dials earlier that you've seen on television. And um, we also have an online dial, which we're fortunately able to use right now, where each respondent uh, heard one of those two messages, but not both. So that's called a split sample in research. And the reason being that if we played both messages for someone, they would be influenced by the first one with how they would react to the second one. And while we could um, avoid order bias by randomizing the order of those, uh, we really felt it was more important to just let people hear one message or the other and make sure the sample size was large enough that we can analyze each segment based on each message. And, and that's the methodology that we use. So the more they agreed with what they were hearing, the more they slid their slider up toward 100. 
the more they disagreed, the more they slid down towards zero. We uh, pull the position of that slider every second. And that's what creates the line chart over the video that you've probably seen on TV. So you can use any number on that scale. And the farther you go in either direction, the more intensity you feel uh, one way or the other. So once we completed all of that, we went into analysis of, of what we found. The never versus sometimes wears. And the first key attitudinal difference that we found is that the never group are largely skeptics about the reality of the pandemic and more specifically how wearing a mask would prevent the spread. So even if they are believers in the pandemic itself, which of course is becoming more and more prevalent, whereas earlier on there was more disparity between those who believed and didn't believe. And that, that gap is narrowing tremendously. But there is still a large segment of the population who are not convinced that wearing a mask is gonna help at all. And that's the group that we're most looking to influence. Whereas the sometimes group, um, the sometimes group thought that the assertive message was informative, professional, and detailed. The never group, we're three times more likely to actually find that message arrogant and negative. And I'm gonna take you through a few moments of those to actually show you how we dissect individual words and phrases. Because again, we're not trying to decide which of these two messages is the one to go with. We're trying to Frankenstein together this optimal message based on individual words and phrases and narratives that can then be stitched together into the most perfect message that we can. So I'm going to have Eric play another couple of clip, quick clips for you, and it's going to show you how we see the data that has come in from the dial testing with the lines that trace over the video. And then I'll actually take you into a few moments and we'll kind of dissect some of the things that she was saying. Some Americans are refusing to do this. They resist being told what to do. But this rule is necessary to protect people and to prevent suffering in the community. The blue line are sometimes wearers, the red line are never wearers. Wearing a mask helps me keep most of my droplets to myself. If I'm outside and able to keep six feet away from people, then I'm not going to wear a mask. If I'm jogging around my neighborhood or walking my dog or sitting on the driveway with friends and neighbors, no mask. But in a store, I think a mask is reasonable. You don't know what I might be carrying and I don't know what you might be carrying. We don't know the vulnerable people in each other's orbit. A mask limits the sharing. So you saw in that second clip, just because it's most fresh in your memory, when she said, sitting around the neighborhood, able to distance, no mask, all of the lines lined up. The blue line are sometimes wears, red line are never wears, and the black line is the, was the aggregate of the two. And they all lined up when she said that. And then when she started talking about, but in a store, and that's when the lines started to spread. The sometimes wears were in agreement, and the never wearers began to disagree at that point. And that was a diverging, a diverging moment. So what we then do is we go through all of the messaging on both studies and we start to look for these key inflection points where the two groups begin to differ. So in the assertive example, um, we saw that things really started to peak out for the sometimes wearers when she said, even if you feel fine and don't have any symptoms, you can spread it to other people. Whereas shortly after that, the never wearers uh, had one of their lowest rating moments when she said the CDC strongly recommends wearing a mask to help keep droplets out of the air. What we later learned is that's because the CDC at first came out and said, don't wear a mask, it's not gonna help you at all. And so the credibility issue there from public officials became glaringly important. But then where the never wears spiked in that third example is where she said some Americans resist being told what to do and uh, are not wearing a mask. And a lot of, of course, the never wearers were feeling that that was applicable to them. Comparing that to the more gentle video, in the first example where the, uh, the never wearers had their second highest peak, 
She said small sample studies show that wearing a mask won't prevent contracting COVID-19. And again, that maps to what was originally said by the CDC before people were told they should wear a mask. Uh, the never wearers then had their highest peak where she said, if I'm able to social distance or when exercising, no mask is required. And they had their lowest moment when she said in a store, a mask is reasonable and it limits sharing. And when you take that third point and compare it with the first point, those make sense. They're opposite statements and the reaction was, was opposite. So what we really need to do is figure out how do we take what we've learned here and put that into something that is gonna be helpful in order to influence behavior. So for the never group, um, there were sentiments that resonated well with them from each video, especially in the more gentle video. Um, when she said things like, Americans resist to being told what to do. Masks don't prevent one from getting affected by the virus. Masks shouldn't be worn outside when six feet away. The gentle approach was also rated more sincere and caring by the never wearers. Uh, sometimes and never, they differed in their perception of each video. The sometimes group thought that the assertive, assertive approach was actually informative and professional and detailed, whereas the never group um, didn't care for it at all. They found it arrogant, they found it negative. Interestingly, the general approach was seen equally as caring and sincere in both groups. So we're starting to see that clearly testing the gentle and assertive approaches, we're starting to see that the assertive approach is gonna be much less effective to achieving our goal. So historically, um, more active, the sometimes wearers are now less likely to feel comfortable returning to normal activities. And this is a very important point in the whole what's in it for me notion of how people make decisions. So the sometimes group are more active in travel and leisure. They, over, they also over index uh, in certain regions of the country, uh, age group and um, education. Attitudinally, the sometimes group is over 50% less likely to be comfortable returning to those normal activities. Um, while half of the never group would prefer that even a store when they go out doesn't require them to wear a mask. So they're prepared to get back to normal and they don't wanna be infringed upon having to wear a mask to do so. Um, and these two groups also had a wide gap in their, in their attitudes. The never wearers were skeptical about the reality of the pandemic, as I mentioned earlier. That gap is narrowing since we ran this study a number of weeks ago. Um, and while the sometimes wearers are not resistant to wearing a mask, um, it's apparent how these two groups are reacting very differently to this messaging. So we also, asked some open-ended questions. We wanted to hear from them in their own words. How do they feel about what they're hearing in these videos? And starting with the never wearers, these are some of the things that we heard. The science is unconfirmed. This is America, we have freedom of choice. Uh, I'm not sick, so I'm not convinced that wearing a mask is gonna help everyone. And we asked them if they could talk with the speaker, what question would they ask of the speaker that wasn't answered for them? So we heard things like, do you believe in freedom? Where do you get your information? Don't try to influence me. That's what we heard from the never wearers. The sometimes wearers said things like, I'll wear a mask when it's necessary. Uh, if it can prevent the spread, I'm all for it. Um, I already wear a mask uh, and um, I may start wearing one even more often. And when we asked what questions would you like to ask that weren't answered for you, they said things like, um, I think she covered everything, I'm all good. Um, how often can a mask be reused? What types of masks are most effective? So uh, the questions that these people wanted to ask is, how do I make what I'm already doing more effective? How do I know I'm doing it right? So again, you can see the disparity between these two groups at times is very, very wide. Um, we also do exercises like this one where we ask them to choose from a list of words that they felt describes the tone of each video. So in this case, we asked the never wearers to describe uh, words that describe the tone of both the assertive and the gentle video. And if you see things like um, uh, the assertive video, they found it to be arrogant, 
They did find it to be informative. That was encouraging for us. Um, they didn't find it factual. That's curious. Um, and they found it negative. Whereas the gentle video, uh, they found to be sincere and caring. So that interesting. But as you'll see in a minute, there are a lot of things in here that make us scratch our, our heads and say, hmm. Uh, the sometimes wearers found the assertive video to be informative. They found it to be thorough, detailed, professional. Um, and they found the gentle one to also be informative and realistic. But notice things like arrogant and negative uh, really don't track with them. So again, what we're realizing here is this isn't just a difference in opinion. This is a fundamental difference in how these people process information and make their decisions. So at the end of the day, what do we learn from this? Well, we learned that the gentle, the gentle approach is really the only one to pursue and try to refine. Um, the assertive approach is not gonna get us anywhere with our never wearers. Um, and we have some statistics here that back that up. Of the never group, 35% of them were influenced to wear a mask more often from the gentle approach. And that's really our biggest takeaway. So we know that they're persuadable. We know that they can be influenced. We just have to figure out the right wording and the right phrases that will make that happen. And when that could happen, imagine if we could move 30% of that audience and how many lives that can translate into. So the things that do leave us scratching our heads because good research often uh, answers some questions but creates others for us. Um, is, there an, is there an ideological uniformity among mask, mask wear, never, never wearers that we can tap into? Is there something about them ideologically that we can use to unify them around the notion of wearing a mask? Can we explore their reaction to stores posting signs that instead of saying, in order to enter, you must wear a mask, or we refuse service to anyone who doesn't wear a mask, what if the messaging was changed to, would you mind wearing a mask or would you please wear a mask? How would that change behavior? Um, regarding the conspiracy theories, what, are they, what is it that they fear more than the disease? This is what led us to thinking, okay, now, and if we're gonna change their minds, we have to know what's in it for them, right? And getting back to normal, ending all of this chaos that's happening right now is what's really important to people. So what if we could flip it from, um, wearing a mask will help slow the spread of the disease to wearing a mask will help speed things getting back to normal, getting people back to work, getting kids back to school. Um, so do we talk more openly about the specific concerns of, of the never wearers as well? The notion that cloth masks don't work, they accumulate more germs and concentrate them. So do we approach those things head on and acknowledge them as opposed to ignoring them? And then finally, like I said, we really ultimately need to decide what's in it for them. And where, where we're now taking this study in future phases is going to be to focus on uh, less on what masks and face coverings do to slow the spread and instead what they can do to speed our return uh, back to normal. And so with that, I'll say uh, thank you so much for listening. And um, Michael, if we have any questions, I'd love to answer some. Yeah, I'll read. Uh, they're in the chat. So if right now we got two questions and could you access the chat, David? And, uh, and then you can see, uh, Paul, um, we got one from Wink, Griffin Wink um, that says, this is fascinating. How did you choose the participants? Were they compensated? What was the ideal number of participants? Do you think demographics of the actor affected the participant response? Okay, yeah, um, that's an excellent question. So um, because this was purely an online survey, this phase of the study did not include any um, in-person or online interviews. We went through a large online survey of what's called a panel provider. So anytime a mass survey is done, there are these companies called panel providers that we go out to. We give them the specifications of who it is that we want to survey. 
and they have a database of generally hundreds of thousands of people. So they filter them down to the types of people that we want to hear from, and then they blast out those invitations. Those people are compensated, depending on which panel they belong to. They might be compensated with money, they might be compensated with points that they then cash in for goods and services. But yes, they are all compensated to some degree. And um, we settled on that sample size of 142. We were going for 140 to 150. We wanted a minimum of 70 to 75 in each group so, uh, to see each video so that we knew we had enough data that we could rely upon. And that's really at the lowest end of what we feel we can get away with. And because we're a smaller company and it's a self-funded study, of course, I'll be transparent that we have to balance how many people do we interview while still making sure that the data that's collected is valid. And that 70 to 75 per segment mark is, is, down, is at the lower end of what we find acceptable. So that's, that's how we settled on that particular number. Did I answer the whole question, Michael? Or was there uh, there is a, one, more, one more portion about um, the actor. Oh, what about her? Uh, does, do you believe that the actor can affect participant, how the participant responds? I guess whether it's male or female or her inflections yeah. on saying the words? Uh, ab absolutely can. And that's specifically, as I said earlier, that's why we use actors, first of all. And we, we coach them on how it is that we want them to deliver a message. So you'll notice that she delivered the assertive message a little bit more assertively. And the gentle message, she was a little bit softer and more gentle. It's not just the words and phrases, but it's also the body language and how it comes across. I mentioned earlier, we do a lot of litigation research, and that's where it's most glaring how it's not just about the words, how an attorney walks up to a jury box and positions themselves, or how a witness is sitting in a witness box, sitting still versus squirming around. Um, Nonverbal communication is so critically important to how messages get conveyed. So it is important that you use the same actor for all the messages in one study, because then you, otherwise you have a variable you can't control. If we were to rerun this study with a different actor, might we get different results? That's definitely possible. And for a larger scale study, when the budget would allow, we would often uh, test it, especially if there is at all a gender or a race or a socioeconomic, um, element to the topic, that's when it becomes even more important that, that something like that may be undertaken. So that's an astute question and it can often be, often be relevant. Okay, <clears throat> we have another question from uh, Paul. Hey Paul, Paul Bowles out at, at, uh, in Washington. Hey, Paul. Uh, do you have the ability to uh, sample continuous response signal faster than one second intervals? This could yield interesting data related to slopes of the lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. In our, in our dial testing, we pull once per second. Technically speaking, we can pull as fast as we would choose to. Uh, right now, our technology is designed to do it once per second. Um, but anything is possible in, in software development, as people know. So uh, if the need arose where we needed to be able to pull half second or say quarter second, um, we could. The difference between things like neuro research, where polling down to microseconds can be very relevant, we have to decide with something like dial testing, which is not non-conscious. It's very conscious where people are making a decision. Uh, will we get notably different data down at the sub one second mark? And um, up till date, we've decided no in the studies that we've done, and we've kept it to one second. But uh, faster than one second is certainly technically possible. Okay. He had a, another question at the end. It says, can this tech uh, be embedded with other tech platforms like iMotions? Yeah, absolutely. So we're collecting data, ones and zeros, just like any other tech. So um, we have worked with organizations that, for instance, have done eye tracking as well as dial testing. So people have watched a video on a screen and eye tracking has tracked where they've looked and dial testing has tracked their sentiment. And then you can compare the data together and you can see that not only when she said this did the dials go up, but 
uh, people were also looking over in this area. That would be more relevant when it's not just an actor, but maybe it's a scene or an ad where they might be looking at a certain part of the ad while something is said, while people reacted negatively. And that then gives us another data point beyond just the words to also see what they're looking at. So yes, the data can be compared with really any other any other data that's collected during those moments and, and can, be, uh, can be compared and correlated that way. Okay, uh, anyone else have any other questions? Paul added one more thing on here about time locks. How do you time lock the lines to video? Is there a delay? Yeah, and that's I a good question. Probably give you a call to talk more about this offline. Yeah, no, it's a good question. So there, there's a natural delay in how long it takes for people to process the information and move the dial. And we generally find that that's about a one second to two second lag. Um, we use dial testing more as a diagnostic and not as, a, as something that's scientifically definitive. So when we see a line start to trend up and we're listening to what was being said at that time, we can easily map it to what it is that people are reacting to. And you'll usually see that reaction start one to two seconds after what it was that made them start to react. Okay. So anyone else? Uh, we have kind of caught up on the questions that were in the chat already. Does anyone have anything that they want to cover about the study, about the methodology with, um, with David Paul? Are we good? Silence means no. We have a little bit more time. Oh, oh okay. I'm getting a lot of Great info, great presentation. So um, that's nice. Thank you. Okay. If everybody, uh, wait, 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 here's another one. Uh, what other industries do you work with? So outside of things like this that would often factor into public policy that we do a lot of work in, we also work in um, consumer product. So we have a study in the field right now where we're testing messaging around a home appliance and how to get people to choose our client's appliance versus a competitive's appliance. And we're, we're brought in when it comes down to how those products and services need to be positioned and messaged and communicated. Um, we're not graphic designers and artists and things of that nature. So we work hand in hand with those people. Um, so we do a lot in marketing and branding and advertising. Um, we also do a lot in entertainment uh, where uh, TV pilots get tested before they go on air. I'm sure you've all heard about TV pilot testing or show that didn't test well and didn't make it on air. Almost every show that goes on television gets dial tested and most of those are done with our dials. And it's not just the networks now, it's uh, Netflix and Amazon and Hulu and all of them, uh, Disney Plus, Apple, Apple Plus, all of that. So a big part of our business is in um, entertainment and then of course advertising, branding, marketing, public policy and some politics. Okay. So another question is, what would you say are the three messaging takeaways from this uh, study? From this particular study? So I think the three, take, so three takeaways would be um, that we definitely need to take a more gentle versus a more assertive approach. And that was important for us to figure out. Um, we also know that there's, a, there's an ideological factor at play with the non-wearers. They very specifically don't want to be told what to do. They're not interested in just falling in line and doing what others are telling them to do. They have to come to the realization for themselves that this is something that's going to benefit them and those that they care about. Um, and simply doing it for the public good is not going to be an effective enough message to move the more staunch non-wearers um, to become wearers. Um, so I think that then leads to the third thing is that we need to really take the approach of what's in it for you and how is doing this thing that we want you to do going to benefit you and help you with what's important to you, which is getting back to normal faster, 
getting people back to work, stabilizing the economy, getting kids back into school. And if we can frame it in that way versus this is what we need to do to slow the pandemic for society as a whole, then we stand a better chance of motivating this non-wearing group. Okay. There's a question about getting a copy of the slideshow. We are going to make access to this recorded uh, presentation with the help of uh, Dial Smith's uh, YouTube channel. So, uh, David, the slide, I guess a PDF of the slideshow would be available. It's very similar to your report. So there is that as well that I shared with some people. Yeah, it is. And the report is, is probably more designed to be consumed without me delivering it. So yeah. we'll make sure that the report is available. Okay. The video of this presentation will be available. And if there's anything that's not covered in those two, please note my contact information here on the screen and feel free to reach out directly and I'll, I'll get to you whatever you like. Okay. Uh, we have a question about what percentage was never wearers of the population? Do you, do you have a projection for that, I guess, General Paul? Well, yeah, based on this study, it, it ran about a third of the population fell into the, the rarely or never okay. group. And while that puts them in the minority, which is great, um, a third of the population is still incredibly significant, especially when they're not segregated, they're intermixed with everybody else. So you bring that roughly one third of the population in with everybody else, and you can effectively negate the benefits of mask wearing that the other two thirds might be doing by introducing that non-wearing population into, you know, into that group. And kind of related, is there any thoughts on ideology that you picked up when you were uh, doing this in relation to COVID? I guess political ideology or? Um, yes, I mean, political ideology, not, um, rarely in non-wearers did tend to skew um, Republican. Uh, they, they tended to skew to the right, um, tended to skew a little bit lower in income, a little bit more blue collar. Um, uh, kind of working class and a little bit more in the, in the south of the United States. Okay. Any other questions at this point? I think David, wait, wait, let's pop that. Kind of more of a, uh, why do you think that ideology has played such a big role in a public health issue? Mm, well, I think it so much frames the way we think about and how we feel about so many areas of our lives. And if you really start to dissect how these groups differ, probably to even a greater degree than we dissected here, you're going to start to find more disparity in those who have health insurance and those who are at a certain income level where they're comfortable taking care of their health, even on their own to a certain degree. Um, you've, got a, you've got people who can work from home or work remotely and have been less affected by this. And then you've got those who have to physically go to work somewhere uh, who can be even more impacted by this. So as you start to break down the different segments of the population, you start to get into what are the specific things that are directly impacting those people? And then that is what really starts to frame how they think and feel about things. Okay. Well, we have no more questions at this point. Uh, we got nine minutes left, but if we're done, I wanna, if, one more shout out, no questions. I'm gonna say thank you so much to David Paul for the presentation, really great. Appreciate you spending the time with us. And uh, again, <clears throat> as David indicated, if you have uh, you know, stuff that you want to talk directly to him, his, his contact's there and he's invited you, know, you to, to reach out to him. Uh, watch for the, uh, we'll be sending out AF will to people who are interested, a link to the recording if you want to use the recording for something. Uh, we're going to work with um, David's company to post it on their YouTube channel for now and, and probably have a link from AF, AAF Lubbock resources to it. Uh, and that's it. Thanks so much, David. It was great, interesting, well done. Really enjoyed it. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and to everyone who took time to attend. I really do appreciate it. All right. Well, that's all we have for now. Thanks for joining us uh, this month. Uh, we're 
working on our next speaker for next month. Uh, I get, uh, we're planning to, if we do it, as we will be planning to do it as a, uh, um, a Zoom, uh, we'll again continue to make a complimentary to those who wish to attend that are outside of our current membership. But you should look into being a member. If you're interested, please reach out to us and we'll, we'll get you some information on how to join the AF Lubbock chapter. That's the commercial. So we're done. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for everyone else for attending. Uh, Cindy or Janice, do you have anything you want to add before we sign off? No, not at all. Just to say thanks, David. And, and I'll let Janice talk here too as well. But thank you so much, David and Eric, for you know spending almost two hours of your day with us mm -hmm. and providing this really interesting and compelling information. And I will definitely be reaching out to both of you uh, to get more from you. I really appreciate that invitation. Absolutely, M more than happy to do it. And um, hopefully there are some takeaways that people can, can uh, deploy in their work right away. And thank you so much, guys. Uh, we really appreciate you taking your time and thanks to all of the people that came uh, to watch this presentation. We appreciate all of you too. So that's, that's all I've got. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Cindy, we can say goodbye. Mm -hmm. Bye. See ya. Bye, Thanks. Everyone. Thank you.